Hi everyone, um, I hope you're all doing well. Welcome to this session on post-pandemic series, Visualising a New Era of Virtual Events. Um, I'm Katie Simkis and I'm from VFIS. Super excited to be joined by three amazing panellists to discuss how they visualise virtual events in this new era post-pandemic. So let's get started. Um, I just want to do some quick introductions just so you guys can get to know your panelists a little better. So first up, we've got Francine Bloom. So Francine works at the University of Maryland Global Campus as the Assistant Vice President Career Development. She's a leader in career services and experiential education with over 35 years experience in the education industry. Among numerous other initiatives, she's also led career development and planning for 93,000 UMUC students and over 254,000 alumni. So great to have you here, Francine. Thank you uh, so much. It's an honor and a pleasure. No worries at all. So moving on, we've got Eric Guth from KEG Media. So Eric is a serial entrepreneur beginning in the 1980s in a wireless technology business that included systems and circuit design, product development, marketing and sales to Fortune 500 companies. Today, Eric is the creator of the QSO Today brand of podcasts and virtual conventions that support the amateur radio hobby community. Eric has created four sexual conventions on the VFIS platform, so we're looking forward to hearing his thoughts. So welcome, Eric. Thank you so much, Katie. And then finally, our third panelist today is Christian Newman from National Urban League. Christian is an award-winning brand strategist and integrated marketer with a broad range of experience and expertise in several sectors. Um, those include sponsorship procurement, event production, public relations, media relations, re relations, sponsorship activations and community relations. So thank you so much for joining us, Christian. And, and thank you all for joining us today, guys. Um, obviously, I appreciate you guys taking the time for this panel discussion. We're super happy to have you all here and super happy and excited to get your insights on virtual events. So I've got some questions for us to get started. Um, I just wanted to start really with one of the most common questions that, that we get here at VFA. So how have your virtual events compared to your in-person or your hybrid meetings? And when I ask this, I'm, I'm talking about how it affects your planning experience, the experience of your sponsors and your exhibitors, and also obviously the experience of your attendees. So, um, Francine, do you want to start with this one? I would be delighted. Uh, we are huge fans of virtual events for, before the pandemic because we're an online university. We have students around the world, alumni around the world. So the first thing we noticed with our V events was that we had much more participation. Um, we had people had much more access to us through our virtual events, through our um, our career events, and through our prospective students events. Uh, we had less stress for our participants and less stress for us. Easier, there were fewer logistics uh, that gave us more bandwidth to pay attention to our goals and to the people who were participating in our events. Uh, it was much more cost effective for us. And uh, the a little bit of the downside, which Jonas mentioned in his keynote, was that there wasn't the same degree of networking. But what we found was that people got very creative because they definitely did want to network. One of our booths in our event was uh, a place where people could come to get advice on how to present themselves to employers, but we found that they also started networking with each other. In fact, in one of our events, as I was going through the text, on three love connections. So they were definitely able to network. And now with the new networking features that VFairs has, we have a little more professional kind of networking going on as well. So those were, we really found it very, very advantageous to have the virtual events over the in-person events. As Jonas said, it's it's ideal to, to have both and to be able to have people choose which kind of event they wanted, but we saw that our community really wanted the event and found them very successful. Awesome. Oh, that's great. You know, great to hear. And I think that's a common theme as well, especially with, with 
universities. What about for you, Christian? Has it been a similar kind of effect on, on your events, hosting them virtually? Well, I um, have to say that one of the things that we learned was that you must know your audience. And we were a little bit... Um, we were a little bit hesitant about a virtual event because we do serve an older audience and we were just unsure how they would respond to a virtual event when they were, you know, so used to in-person events. Um, what we did was um, the VFairs platform with the visuals really made them feel comfortable. And we started our promotions just really outlining what the virtual environment would look like. And we kept it simple. I think it's very important when planning a virtual environment that you plan around who your target audience is. Um, of course, I am someone who embraces is technology and I want all the bells and whistles, but sometimes um, that doesn't work for your audience. So I've, you know, created my personas like I would ordinarily do with a marketing campaign. I did that for a virtual event and really kept it um, simple. Um, I broke it down into four things that this virtual event will offer. Networking, which is very important, the content um, and the sessions. And um, of course, um, two other things, the gaming with the leaderboards. Mm -hmm. I love that um, option to be able to <laughs> play the games and win prizes. Um, and the most important thing too was um, just also the exhibits. So being able to keep it very simple with those four buckets, we proved to have a virtual event and it's something that we will um, move forward with. Um, planning based on our audience. Fab. I think that's a, a really good point. I think especially when a client has got um, an older audience, it is a bit of a concern for them how quickly or easily they'll be able to navigate the platform. But it's one of those things, as soon as you've held your first event and mm -hmm. you can strip it back, you can simplify it as much as you like to suit your audience needs. We've got other clients who are kind of putting all the bells and whistles on because you know they want to give their clients something new in comparison to last time. Um, what's your experience been like, Eric? Obviously, you've had quite a few um, opportunities with us using the virtual platform. Well, I, I have to say that um, I, I come from the um, the podcasting side. So I'm a podcaster with over 400 live interviews in um, over the last eight years. And for the amateur radio community, the amateur radio community, which is about 800,000 ham radio operators in America, maybe 3 million worldwide, uh, in, in that community, there was an event every weekend someplace in America. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, you have 50 states, you have state conventions, you have weekend conventions, and the pandemic brought it all to a halt. So I have no experience uh, putting together any kind of convention or meeting. And so I, it was a lark. Um, I approached VFairs in order to create the first a virtual ham radio convention and i wanted people walking around outside the building and i wanted an experience that would create um what was uh a, a virtual reality uh when the reality was no one was going anywhere and so um i started with no experience i've done four um conventions on v fairs I, i've screwed one up trying to um integrate it with something else uh, some other technology um, but i've learned each time and i have a very forgiving audience so but what i have seen is is, is that um when it was new i got twenty five thousand uh re registrations on the first one um, wow. but but over time you know they've kind of dropped down now to about five thousand each time and yeah. um so that's you know, that's kind of, I think that's par for the course. And I think that as we start to go with live events, I've just came back from a live event in America that had 31,000 yes. radio operators show up, um, that we're going to see, you know, some changes on the one hand. On the other hand, um, you know, with a, with a huge audience, uh, I think there's a lot of people that will still come to virtual because we can do things in virtual we can't do uh, in live events. Definitely. We're finding a lot of our clients now, now they've hosted their virtual events, you know, completely virtual, and they've gained so many new attendees that they wouldn't have been able to get physically. Um, 
and then kind of having to go hybrid to keep that virtual audience as well. Obviously, Eric, you mentioned there um, that the conventions that you've hosted, just thinking for our attendees, it might be helpful or useful to know the types of events that, that you guys have hosted, Francine and Christian. So Francine, do you want to talk through the different types of, of virtual events that you've hosted? Sure. We've I think we've hosted about 50 V Fairs events if we really think about it. So one set of events that we have of which I'm a part, but I, I don't control is for prospective students and new students. It's like an open house. And again, being an online university, there are a lot of issues around that. So people are are nervous and uh, the Christian was saying, you know, they may not be so comfortable with the online environment and the open house helps them get comfortable. They can walk through a sample classroom. They get to meet the people that are offering the services at the university. It's a great way to recruit students and a great way to help new students set up for success. And then I'm responsible for our virtual recruiting events and our virtual career fairs. And that's where we connect our employers with our community of students and alumni. And those we have uh, approximately four times a year. We have small events with around employers uh, and then we have our large career with around 60 employers and we actually have around 1100 to 1300 students and alumni participating at our small and our large events one of the great things is they can participate asynchronously so even though online expands access by having the event open uh, earlier before the live event itself people who can't be there at the live event can introduce themselves to the employers, give their elevator pitches, can say which jobs they're interested in, and that's another way they make connections. Uh, and for our prospective students and new students, that is also recorded, so if they're not able to come to the live event, they're able to watch it later. So those are the two main kinds of events we have. We've been so successful, though, that our colleagues university are asking questions about what events they might be able to host 3D fairs, so we're excited to talk about that. Awesome. I love it when that happens as well, when you get, you know, lots of other departments seeing how successful one event was and kind of jumping on the bandwagon. Um, what about you, Christian? What sort of types of events have you hosted in, overall now in Tokyo? Right. Our um, organization, the National Urban League, which is one of the highest rated um, civil rights um, organizations um, in the country, um, in the U.S., we have a annual conference um, in person that attracts over uh, 15,000 attendees. Um, so um, we produce that conference virtually. So that means we had a career fair, we had an expo, we had our plenaries, we had forums, we had workshops, we had networking receptions, and we had social events all within the V-Fairs environment. So everything that we did at the live conference, we duplicated that in the VFairs environment. So this year we are exciting, excited that this is our first hybrid event that we're working with VFair. So we'll still have that in-person event, but for those who are unable to attend in person, they can experience um, all the event um, features virtually. Awesome. And obviously you guys have got a wealth of knowledge off the platform but clearly you've got a wealth of knowledge and experience with vfairs as well which is which is amazing um on that point occasionally we do have new clients that come to us asking specifically how they can make their virtual events more interesting um so just from your experience of hosting you know those virtual events in those specific sectors what would your top tips be um starting with starting with you eric that's okay yeah, sure. Sure, Katie. Um, I kind of felt that the, the most important thing was to have great content. So mm -hmm. I run between 60 and 100 presentations on up to eight tracks uh, during the um, during the a weekend event. Uh, and then the other thing that seems to me that's the most important, and I keep um, everyone at VFairs knows uh, my interest in this, and that is to create these virtual spaces where where exhibitors and people that come to visit them can actually have conversations and demonstrations. And then I also think that um, then creating networking spaces that are like informal rooms where I'm um, in, uh, and Jonas showed this in his, um, in his demonstration, the, the rooms where if you come into the sound area of where people are talking, um, that creates a space that's very similar to a live um, convention floor. So, mm -hmm. 
I think those two are the, you know, great content and, um, and virtual spaces where people can, can see each other and speak. And it doesn't feel so much like Zoom. Definitely. Definitely. Right. What about you, Christian? I am so excited. I'm excited about the value that we were able to provide. The most interesting piece was the directory. Um, everyone is in search of just connection and connecting with people. What we did for our annual conference is that we, inside of these chairs, there's a directory of all conference attendees. Um, and in that directory, it had their name, their industry, where they were located. So that was a really valuable and a feature that made it very interesting because we noticed that attendees were on the platform 24 seven, like 2 a.m. in the morning. And what they were doing was they were going to that directory and being very intentional about making this virtual experience um, worthy and beneficial. So they went through the directory, um, I, I, I able to identify who they wanted to connect with and sent them uh, messages um, via chat. And that's something that we were unable to produce at our live conference. And it was great that we had that feature was available, um, having the listing of all the conference um, attendees and being able to connect. We didn't share their personal information, but you were able to chat with them directly. Perfect. Yeah. And I think when the pandemic first came along, you know, people's concerns were how are we going to emulate? what we do at a physical event and now it's almost like the physical event can't emulate the the you know the features that the the virtual platform can give so i definitely think hybrid is going to continue to grow and grow although we do have a lot of clients that are just sticking completely virtual because it is it is a lot easier i suppose to do to do the one occasionally christian you mentioned obviously having the the gamification earlier mm -hmm. Um, we have quite a lot of clients interested in how they really keep their attendees engaged um, in a virtual event and in hybrid events. Would you say gamification is, is one of the top features you use to keep people engaged or what other sort of features do you rely on? Yes, um, gamification was the top feature <laughs> that we use. Um, and not only that, um, having our conference um, on the VFairs platform really helped us to be able to um, increase our revenue. And because not only am I responsible for executing the virtual event, I'm also responsible for packaging and selling it. <laughs> and so uh, with the success of the event last year, we've been able to increase our revenue about 250% because of the being with the gamification, being able to drive attendees to particular sponsor booths. And the sponsors who usually in the live event space will connect with 100 people during three days, they actually connected with 3,000 people during wow. three days. Yes. <laughs> and um, have more of a meaningful connection with them. So there's a lot of success stories, case studies, and gamification, um, in addition to the announcements uh, within the environment, were major drivers where we were able to um, control. And I just want to um, say this um, before I end this segment. You have to be careful um, about that because it becomes addictive that you're able to watch consumer attendee behavior and say go here you know for a hundred you know points on the leaderboard and they go and so you have to be very careful that you don't misuse that quote unquote power and make sure that your attendees still have an organic experience because we did find ourselves using that that tool a lot more often and we had to really kind of reset and say hey we're directing our attendees too much and let them explore organically. Yeah, that's a really good good point, actually. I never actually thought about it like that. It's almost like you get a little a power trip, I guess, from having <laughs> control that, you, that you've never had before. Um, what about for you, Eric? Are there any kind of specific features or tips that you've got for the attendees watching today, specifically on, on keeping your audience engaged? 
Well, I think I, I said it before in terms of, you know, great content and um, places for networking and conversation. One, one mm -hmm. of the things that we had was, is that our, our program is over a weekend, but all of the, the presentations end about 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. But the rooms that we were using, uh, we were using a Kumo space lounges that were connected to VFairs. Mm -hmm. And um, and those lounges were open all night. And there were conversations going in those lounges, you know, all night long. Uh, even very large conversations where there might be um, uh, 40, 50, 60 people in the room and they'd set up the room so that the audio was heard throughout the room. So um, that that turns out very well for us. Now, the leaderboard is a sore subject because I have a very technical audience and um, a very technical audience means there are people mm -hmm. that actually know how to set up multiple computers and they are scrubbing the VFAIR's HTML code off right off the screen and finding every single point. Uh, and they usually find it within the first hour or two. So you're, you're, you're all of a sudden you're getting a lot of complaints from people that are saying, how, how did this guy get the maximum number of points in the first hour? So you, it depends, you have to know your audience. And so yeah. the leaderboard for me is not, is not a, a, a draw because it draws out um, the, the best hackers in the world uh, to, wow. you know, to get on your platform yeah. and take advantage of it. Definitely. I think um, knowing your audience is probably one of the, the key takeaways, I suppose, probably from this session um you know if i'm giving a demo to somebody that's hosting like i don't know a medical conference with lots of senior doctors or surgeons most of the time they're probably not going to want to do a scavenger hunt or the photo booth or you know stuff mm -hmm. like that so um different features are relevant for for different events and different audiences i suppose Obviously, keeping the event interesting, keeping attendees engaged are goals for, you know, virtual events. But what have been your personal main goals when you're hosting a, a virtual event and how have they performed? Have you been able to achieve those goals, Francine? Definitely. Uh, for our virtual recruiting events in our career fairs, actually, our primary goal is to identify job seekers. Uh, and the mm -hmm. only way we can do that is by having an exciting event with really interesting employers in an engaging virtual environment. And then people raise their hand and say, yes, I'm, I'm looking for a job. I'm going to come to this event. And we direct content to them about best practices for job seeking because we have, again, 90,000 students. They're all at different points in their life lives. They range in age from 17 their 90s. Everybody has different needs. It's not like typical freshman, sophomore, or first semester graduate students. So by having an exciting event, we're able to get content to them. And then our second goal, it, goal is connecting jobs to employers. And the VFair platform works really, really well, well for that. Uh, the employers can go in, in advance. They can see who's coming. They can reach out to participants in advance, schedule those one-on-one -on -one chats, have video uh, chats, and identify people for their positions. Um, and we've been really successful. We're most successful with employers who are also really engaged in and committed to virtual events. And that's developed over the last couple of years. And we definitely have more employers who are more comfortable and more committed to the virtual events. Uh, so that's been really successful. And then with our open houses, uh, you know, you think about again learning in an online environment uh, our on, on student is typically 34 to in their 40s you're by yourself you're working you have your family and it's just you and your laptop late at night and it's very isolating so we use that open house to help connect personalize the online learning experience mm -hmm. so they can meet faculty they can meet the service providers meet the people who are advising them meet the people from the library and that just makes it a warmer more more holistic kind of uh, uh, educational activity that they're going to and it makes people more comfortable and if they're more comfortable and more confident they're going to learn better and that's our ultimate goal Awesome. No, yeah. And obviously, it's nice to hear that you've, you've had so many goals and you've been, you know, easily able to to achieve all of them. Um, what about for you, Christian? And what are your usual main goals when you set out to do a, a virtual event? The main goal was for it not to feel like a virtual event. 
um, just really going back to um, the audience, we really wanted to duplicate, we wanted our live event to come to life inside the virtual environment. Um, so what we did was uh, we kept our same graphic designer, worked very closely. And I do have to just say this about vFairs. vFairs has really been a platform that they've been um, extremely agile, adaptive, um, customized, um, our experience, um, very hands-on. The customer service was wonderful because we did not um, choose a standard um, virtual environment because we were really trying to create what we've done, what we did in the past. We used our same graphic designers, we used our same content producers, and we just apply that to the virtual environment. So, what we um, ended up with was just an extension of our event that really hit our main targets. And that was keeping our audience engaged, the audience feedback, but most importantly, the real-time analytics for our corporate sponsors. Um, and the fact is we can't go back <laughs> to just live event only because they're now accustomed to all of this data, uh, which helps us in the planning and helps us move forward that we wouldn't have received um, during a um, live event. Awesome. Yeah. And I think um, that's obviously a, a key point as well. You've got, you, you're now, you have to keep everybody happy, those attendees that, that love the virtual side as well. Are you in the same boat as well, Eric, with in terms of your goals? Did you have kind of certain goals set out? Did you manage to achieve them all? Look, um, I'm an evangelist for amateur radio and uh, and I use the platform in order to educate all of the um the old men and all the young men and women um, who come to uh, my convention about amateur radio and by having you know 60 to 100 presentations all on various aspects uh, about amateur radio has been an amazing thing and it has created uh well we, we also record everything that we're doing and we spend a lot of money on editing at the end so we have a mm -hmm. huge library of content that we've built up um, over 200 presentations with live Q and A, um, and we do the live Q and A. We try to do that on video so that it it looks interactive. So, um, yeah, I, I'm 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 creating all this content uh, for my community. I, I put a, a nice event on uh, two times a year. Uh, it supports a, a few families, I must say, because um, it it takes a lot of work to do it, but. Um, uh, and if we're if we're praising V fairs, you know, anytime I I, I think that I'm going to leave V fairs, um, I just love the team. Uh, you know, I'm in love with my team. I I have to keep working with them. There there's nobody like it. So um, that 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 is the primary reason for my continued loyalty to V fairs is they keep innovating. V fairs keeps innovating, and I love mm -hmm. the team. So that's the that's my yeah. two cents. Oh no, it's, not, it's so nice to hear you know your your feedback, guys. And you're right, VFIS is constantly developing. I feel like we're developing in kind of every you know angle now, from physical, hybrid, virtual, mobile apps, even mm -hmm. you know the hardware and software for physical events now. And um, some of our attendees that are watching right now may not have hosted a virtual event before, or maybe never hosted a virtual event with VFIS. What would be your kind of top tips? for somebody new that's looking to kind of plan a, a virtual event for the, for the first time or any tips in, in running it. Christian, should we start with you? Sure. The first tip that I would um, state is um, attend a couple of virtual events, uh, specifically on the platform <laughs> that you're working with. Um, so I was able to attend a few V fairs events prior to planning uh, my event, which really helped because I was able to say, ha, ah, this will work for me. This won't work for me. And it's really, you have to experience it yourself and also uh, with colleagues. Um, the main tip is that you must have a preview day. It's mandatory, um, <laughs> especially uh, for a lot of our um, novice in tech, that you just give them a day to um, explore the platform to be able to um, work out their technical issues, um, connecting, 
It's um, very key. And then the um, last thing is that have an information booth in your main lobby um, that has tech support. And not only tech support, we divided it up between tech support, support for speakers. Um, there's a lot of questions regarding that leaderboard. <laughs> there's a person, there was a person assigned just for the gamification and leaderboard. So make sure that with that information area that it's broken down into the major um, key um, areas. But yes, that would be my um, top um, visit um, virtual um, event um, and make sure that you um, have that information, information booth in the lobby. Yeah, I, t I totally agree. And I always recommend you attend as many virtual events as possible because the phase of we've got so many features, mm -hmm. so much functionality, and every client picks different features and different ways they want those features to work. So you might see one event, but they will have completely different features to another client and they might use the features or even use the rooms in, in different ways. So that, that's definitely a, a key point. Um, and that guys, preview day, I'm sorry, that preview day, which allows for testing, that's very important. Yes. Okay, definitely, definitely plan that into your kind of your schedule. I know you guys might have some of the same top tips, um, but what about you, Francine? Anything to, to add to Christian's points there? I do. We we don't have a preview day but we do have and uh but i like the mm -hmm. idea of the preview day so with the trainings we have an opportunity for the employers to get comfortable with the platform we have an opportunity for our staff who might be new to get comfortable with the platform and then we also have a variety of ways for our participants comfortable so we have um, a prep mm -hmm. in, we have email we have open advising hours and then when they come to the platform, a PDF, we have a PowerPoint, we have a video. So we're trying to hit all those different learning styles. And the thing is, it's a very easy platform to navigate. You just don't want anybody to feel like they're the deer in the headlights. So you want people mm -hmm. to feel more comfortable. And that's what we do. That's why we have those trainings. The second thing we do is we plan for contingencies. And, and Chris Christian talked about the great tech support that we, there's going to be something. Somebody's going to be logging in with, uh, you know, Explorer 1.0. I used to have a problem when the microwave was on, my internet went off. So I had to make sure my husband knew when we were having VFair <laughs> sessions so he wouldn't eat up his lunch. Something's going to happen, have contingencies for that so that you are, you can quickly respond and, and that works out is great. My third tip for people who are not brand new to, to VFairs is go ahead and try some new features. I know it's scary, but I'm an experiential learning. I'm an experiential learner. Try it out. What's the worst that can happen? It's going to be fine. And the last tip I have, I'm very serious about this. Have fun. These things are so much fun. You can't predict like a, a live event. You don't know who's going to show. You don't know if somebody's going to knock over the water cooler. You don't know everything that going to happen that's okay if riding a roller coaster with the bar down but not wearing a seatbelt you're going to be okay it's just going to be a lot more exciting than you thought and when you're done you're going to want again so have fun with the event just enjoy and know that your participants are having a great time too Bob, I, I love that analogy um anything to add on that eric any other kind of pointers before i go on to the next question for you sure i think um I would echo everything that Christian and Francine said because um, th that's exactly right. I think that I, I assumed at the at the very beginning that I had a technical audience, but then I find that um, you know people they don't realize they weren't running Windows XP or Windows One Two Three or whatever something that's ten years old. Um, they're sitting on ISDN in the middle of a cornfield in Kansas. So I, I've I've made a point to tell people that. The best way to experience a VFairs event is on a big screen. I, I think the mobile app is new, and, and that will that will have an uh, its audience. But the best way to to experience is on a on a big screen with a fast connection. So that means that um, that if you make the assumption that everybody in your market is sitting on fiber optic service, um, you're wrong. And so mm -hmm. therefore, if it's a great weekend event. Go to a hotel in a major city and um, and sit in the room and use their Wi-Fi if you don't have good Wi-Fi. And so I try to do that education before the event. I love the idea of opening, you know, a few days early for people to kind of sandbox in mm -hmm. the in the system. And um, and then other than having a great team, 
uh, you know, that's part of your company um, that that's hosting the event, um, and then working with uh, V Ferris's great team, um, you'll have a great time and a great event, and that's been my experience. Awesome. Fab. And I personally get a lot of questions when I'm giving demos to potential new clients, you know, looking to host events with us, asking specifically for advice with marketing. Um, so how do you usually go about promoting your events? I know some of you will be having more of a niche audience, some of you are more to the public. But for you, Eric, how how did you do that? Did you have any kind of strategies? Was it the same as how you would for a physical <laughs> event or was it kind of a little bit different? Well, look, I, I, I was very fortunate in the, my first event that um, I was able to build a very large mailing list. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and m large mailing lists are very expensive to maintain. So I've spent a, a fair amount of money on programmers to, for example, make sure that I have duplicates in my mailing list and that everything is tagged so I can use it for marketing. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the first thing is, is, is that as you're more successful with your event, you're going to start needing other technologies to kind of support that. Um, that market that you're mm -hmm. trying to go after. Mm -hmm. So I, I communicate with uh, emails um, for my exhibitors. I personally call my exhibitors in order to get them to become exhibitors. Uh, it, it's a long process. I'm about to start it again for my September event. Um, it's I'm, I'm in my 60s and I'm still getting the door slammed in my face. You know, when you're doing a when you're mm -hmm. doing cold calling, so um, you just have to know that that's kind of how it works if you're a small business using, you know, a platform like VFairs. But all of the marketing rules apply. Um, whatever you can use that gets to your target audience. Um, if it's social media, yes. For me, it's, it's mostly um, direct mail. And then I use the exhibitors as they sign on. I get them to start saying, look, for you to be, to be successful in, on a virtual event, You've got to let people know you're going to be there. You've got to invite them to meet with you. Um, you've got to promote the event in order to bring um, people to your booth. And um, and that helps a lot because that mm -hmm. will bring additional attendees. Yeah, that's a really good good point, actually, about, you know, roping in your exhibitors to get involved and, and do some of the, the marketing with you. Um, Christian, what about you? Any kind of specific strategies you use or tips that are specific to a virtual event? Yes. Um, so we did um, social media ads. Um, we did um, Facebook um, and Instagram ads. And those ads were um, very effective because you can um, you can just click the link and directly um, register. One of the things that we noticed was, um, of course, content was important. But um, at that time, a lot of people consider virtual events, they were Zoom. So we just had to be very strategic and intentional about um, letting them know that this is not just another Zoom call. So we had to do screenshots of the environment um, and also um, did like a um, screen share of your experience in the environment. And then the, the most effective, in addition to what Eric stated about getting the exhibitors and speakers to promote their attendance, the other thing was extremely important is that we actually, um, we did demos for organizations and our corporate partners. So they would get their ERG, their employee resource groups together. And we would just go through like a 10 to 15 demo of what the environment and will look like. And that really generated a lot of ex excitement. It's one of those things when you hear virtual event um, prior, you know, at that time, there was something that you thought it you had an expectation. And once you actually got on the VFairs platform, it um, definitely exceeded all expectations for um, attendees. But we had to give them that peak of um, what to, you know, what to expect. Perfect. And I've just got one final question because I know we're coming towards the end of the session. And thank you, everyone, that's writing um, messages as well and questions. I'll try and go through those too. Um, but my final question for the three of you is, how do you plan to use virtual events going forward now that in-person is obviously um, making a comeback, hybrid events are gaining traction as well? What What's your kind of game plan? Which, which route are you going to go down? What about you, Francine? 
we're going to keep using virtual events the way we've been using them, which is as our primary events and with students mm -hmm. and alumni across the world and working time and having different schedules. There's no way that we could be as successful with a live event as we are with our virtual event. So while we may add live events later, and of course as hybrid, um, we're definitely sticking with our virtual events. We just have such success with them. I, I can't imagine changing that. Perfect. What about you, Eric? Well, we're still the uh, only uh, virtual ham radio convention, you know, in, in the ether. And so therefore, mm -hmm. um, we're going to keep doing it as long as we still have an audience. And I mm -hmm. think that, as you can see, if, if, if the price of gas is going through the roof, if the cost of yeah. air travel is going through the roof and everything else, yeah. that um, our virtual event, I think, um, probably will have a, a lot of staying power. So, uh, <laughs> and we're not planning on doing anything hybrid. For me, hybrid means that I have to go into television production in order to have a great hybrid event. And I don't think that's that's on my uh, on in my future. Fab and, and Christian for you guys. Yes, uh, what Eric just said it. Uh, it I just can't um, stress that enough. Our current climate is going to definitely dictate that virtual um, is here to stay with just gas prices and a plethora of other things, especially that's going on here in the states. Um, you have to um, have a virtual option. So our plan is that definitely virtual is here to stay. They will continue to be um, primary events for us in addition to um, we'll have hybrid events. And at our live events um, this year at our conference, we actually have the big screens up where you can see what's going on in a virtual environment. Awesome. Yeah, that's definitely becoming more popular now is linking the two together if you do have a hybrid event. Um, just quickly going into the comments that we've received. Um, Jenny asked, what are the options for gamification through VFAs? Um, Jenny, what I would suggest is definitely reach out to us and we can hop on a call, go through a demo and show you all of the different um, gamification options. My personal favourite is the leaderboard. Um, we do two versions of that now. We've got a scavenger hunt, a photo booth. We also do quizzes, polls, polls that are built into sessions as well. And we've got lots of integrations, um, too many to, to list almost. But if you jump on a call, we can you know specifically focus on that for you. Um, just scrolling down because I'm sure I saw a couple of others. Lorna asked, how do you keep the virtual attendees engaged during an in-person event? Um, I think we've kind of covered that, I suppose. But I think what Christian's point just was, you know, having the screens where you've got mm -hmm. a link between the two and joining those two audiences is definitely going to be key for any hybrid event. Um, just check if there's any more. And I want to say um, also the connectivity. So if you have a leaderboard on your virtual environment, you should also do giveaways at your live event. Um, mm. Again, you the main thing that we um, try to do is mirror everything that we're doing in a live event, try and mirror that as much as possible in the virtual space. Awesome. Perfect. And I've got um, another question here. How do you use your event data to reach out to attendees post-event? I don't know who wants to take that. I can Eric, answer that. Maybe or, I, go on, Francie. <laughs> I, I, this data is just such a goldmine for us because, again, our objective is to how to find jobs. Um, so we look at the data. We look at those who have been successful and who've made connections with employers. If they've made connections with employers, we target information to them on how to have the best interviews and how to follow up, things like that. If they haven't been successful with employers, that's extremely important to us as well. We're able to reach out to them, encourage them to have career advisors to re-examine their job search strategy, because if they didn't connect, something was off. And without that data, we wouldn't know who it with what information. And we don't want to take someone who's successful and say, oh, let's look at your resume again. So this data is extremely important to us. And then we also talk about it to upper management. We are able to talk to our different departments to say who's engaged in which academic programs and who's not as engaged. So it's all very important to us. Perfect. And the last question now, I promise, because I know we, we've already gone over, um, but this one's specifically for you, Eric. Um, so Roy has asked, did you do in-person shows before VFIS? Roy, no. 
<laughs> Roy, <laughs> I, I had never done a show, uh, a convention before I did my first virtual one. It's because I saw everything in in the amateur radio area going going dark, and that that is, you know, four, five or six events every weekend of every year. Um, for a hundred years. And so, um, no, I had no experience. I, I plunged in with both feet and, uh, you know what? I'm still learning. It's Straight learning in process. at the deep end. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, obviously that was an, an awesome discussion. Um, so thank you, Francine. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Christian, for thank sharing you. your insights. Thank with you. Us. Thank um, you. Great job. Obviously, our oh, pleasure. bless you. Thank you. No worries. So that wraps up the session. Um, just want to thank everyone once again for joining the panelists and all of the attendees, all of your comments and all of your questions. Um, if you do have any more questions, just reach out to the team. We can hop on a call, hop on a demo as well. Um, but I hope you enjoy the rest of Discover Next. Don't forget to go and explore the platform. Have a look at the gamification that's included in Discover Next and reach out to us if you've got any event queries. Okay. Awesome. See you all soon. Thanks, guys. Take Thank care. You. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.